deep breath recently. Um, so we're gonna, I want you to think about um, when you were a young person. So that can be, you know, middle school or high school, somewhere between the ages of 11 and 18. So just think about when you were a young person. And now I want you to think about who was an adult preferably not a parent or a guardian that you knew cared about you. So what adult in your life did you know you, you were sure that they cared about you? Could be a teacher. It could be a counselor or a therapist, an activity leader, after school program, staff, um, you know, somebody in a health or wellness center, a family friend, faith leader, even a boss or a supervisor, you know, so think to yourself, what is one adult in your life when you were a young person and you knew that they cared about you? Okay. Um, and I see, thank you. I see somebody put in after school staff. I'm glad I gave that a shout out. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't matter, just an adult in your life who you knew cared about you. And I want you to now think about how did you know that they cared about you? So what did that person say or do that communicated to you that they cared about you and your well being. And I do want to acknowledge that for some of us, it can be challenging to think of an adult who cared about us as a young person. And so, um, if that is the case for you, and if you're if you're struggling with identifying someone, take a moment to think about what what could an adult what could an adult have done to communicate their care and support, right? And so, in the chat. I want to invite you, and I see somebody put already put in, they listen, so thank you. Um, in the chat, I want you to share one or two descriptive words that come to mind when you think of that adult. So for me, for the adult that, I, that immediately comes to mind for me, they were consistent and they were a cheerleader. Those were, those were the two words, like the descriptive words that I would use to describe that adult. So just take a few, um, oh, I see somebody else had a cheerleader, awesome. So just take a few minutes to think of like, what words would you use to describe that caring adult? Thank you so much for your participation in the chat. I see we have caring, understanding. Um, oh, she would light up when she saw me. Yes. Um, also love, role model, paid attention to me, interested, non-judgmental, acceptance, wonderful. So keep those coming. Um, and even as we move on, if, if a word comes to mind, go ahead and drop that in the chat. We welcome all of those description, descriptive words. So, um, so thank you for taking a moment to reflect on your experience as a young person. And I want to remind us at this point that we are all resilient people or we would not be here, right? And that one of the most important factors that supports resiliencies for young people, resiliency for young people is, and, that, and by resiliency, I mean that ability to bounce back in the face of challenges and, um, you know, and, um, and negative experiences and adversity, the, the number one factor that supports resiliency is the presence of a caring adult. So as we move into the next part of our webinar, I wanna invite you to carry the following inquiry through the rest of our time together. And that is, how might our experience as a young person inform how we engage and work with the young people in our lives today. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Marissa. Oh, Nicole, sorry. Pass no worries. No worries, thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah, so here we wanna talk a little bit about um, what we do and how we do our work. And on this slide, you can see our guiding principles. And just to let you know, this is just a few of our guiding principles because we have limited time. Um, we really wanted to just focus on the ones that were relevant for this webinar. Um, and our guiding principles are really our foundation for how we work and, and what we do in our work. Um, so the first one, tobacco is a social justice issue. This is so key. We know that big tobacco has a very long history of targeting our most marginalized communities, um, especially young people and particularly young people of color or those that identify with the LGBTQI. Um, they are disproportionately impacted by tobacco use and tobacco related illnesses. Um, young people have the power and the capacity to lead and create change. 
we really depend on this and you will hear me say it a few times in this webinar. And if you see me offline, we really do um, have this guide us throughout our program um, that young people are not part of the problem. They are part of the solution. And we really believe that they need to be a part of the solution for it to work. And when we work in partnership with young people to address tobacco related issues in our schools and communities. Um, also, we treat current users with respect and we suspend judgment. I saw in the chat box that somebody said non-judgmental. Non That's so important, not only when we interact with young people, but when we interact with anyone, right? We can feel if people have a judgment about maybe we're not making the best health decisions, right? But we're here to, to support and get you through that. Um, and having and not judging and being open-minded is really important to having that open dialogue and communication with anyone, but in particular with young people. Um, and some, some of the TUPI components, all of the TUPI programs throughout the state are required to implement a comprehensive program. And that includes these core components that you see on the slide today. Um, so that is our classroom-based prevention programs. It is our youth development, including our peer education programs, our intervention and cessation programs, which is just a fancy way of saying like our quit support and resources. We also provide staff professional development along with family and community engagement. But during this webinar, we're really gonna focus on the youth development, which is kind of that prevention piece, and we're gonna be focusing on the intervention piece. So as we get started, I'm gonna kind of lead you through our, um, develop, our, our approach to, to youth development. And I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, I am a youth development specialist. I predominantly work with our peer educators in Contra Costa County. Um, our peer educators, and whether you call them a peer educator or a peer advocate, this is really young people that are doing peer-to-peer -peer work. Um, and so I support them with that. And those are sixth through 12th graders. Um, I also am an adult ally or an adult support or whatever the terminology you want to call it for our Contra Costa Youth Health Coalition, um, which is Courage. And that's comprised of 30 st students from around Contra Costa County um, and they're in eighth through 12th grade. And so something that um, you saw the picture of him earlier, Derek Kirk and I um, do is we do refer back to this hearts ladder that's gonna appear on your screen now um, when we are looking at our engagement. So um, the hearts ladder, which some of you may have already been familiar with, is this model that identifies eight levels of young people's participation in a program. And that's kind of why we wanted you to reflect on your own experience so that you um, can kind of, it's all about looking at your own experiences and then looking at your programs today and then how you would like to improve them. So this is really a helpful tool in reflecting on where you may be and engaging young people in a school, in your school and in a community level projects and activities. Um, and as you saw on the previous slide, one of our guiding principles is that young people have the power and the capacity to lead, create, and change. So if you're looking at this, and we've, we've discussed this as a team, um, we couldn't understand why the bottom rings of the ladder are green. Um, usually green is like good and go and and where you wanna be, right? On the heart splatter, that is not the case. Um, if you look at the first rung of like a young person's um, participation, it has like manipulation. Um, adults are kind of using young people as a prop um, or decoration is step two. Um, the third rung is participation for show. All of those are kind of the same thing of you are just using them as a prop. And 
we really like to frame this as, as youth participation as this continuum, right? It's, it's really easy to spot like really great and engaging youth development. And it's really easy to spot when it's not great, right? When you can tell that young people are being used as a prop. And unfortunately, I'm sure I'm not alone in have getting that phone call from some administration or somebody that's like, oh, we're doing this thing for young people, but we forgot to invite young people. Do you have any young people that can come take a picture? Um, so it unfortunately happens, but the reason that we do really talk about Hearts Ladder and reinforce it is you may be on different rungs of the ladder, but it's always about um, assessing where you're at and, and looking forward and what strategies can you use to go ahead and, and work yourself up the ladder. So ideally um, we have 70 plus um, sites that we work with, uh, with peer educators. And so every single site is gonna be at a different rung. And it really depends on what part of the year, what your students look like. It's all about meeting them where they are. But ideally we would, we can confidently say that our site coordinators or our adult allies at our sites are really between that four through eight rung on Hearts Ladder. And that's having young people that are um, that may be assigned tasks and informed, but they are part of the project all the way through the very top where a young person really initiates all the decisions that are being made and initiates that partnership with adults. So I gave you an example of what one is of just like picking up that phone and um, just wanting young people for um, a photo op and young people can feel it. Um, but we also, I've been extremely um, honored to be able to work with some amazing young people and just seeing the great work that they're doing um, is great. We have this one experience of one of our high schools in, in West County. And unfortunately with granting, they didn't have any funding for a while uh, for the 2P Pair Ed program. And the students just decided to keep doing it. Um, they decided to keep showing up to keep providing their peers with this anti-tobacco information. And yes, they did have an adult ally that they could come and, and, and partner with when needed, right? When you need to talk to the principal or get something like that passed. But these young people were like, funding doesn't matter to them. They were all about getting the message out there. So that is like for us an, an amazing example of like what top-notch youth development engagement can, can uh, provide. Um, and again, I just really wanna reiterate in a non-judgmental way that we are, you can be on any part of ideally between four and eight. Um, and, and you may move up in some parts of the program or some components and in other parts, you may be a little bit lower and that's okay. It's really about assessing so that you can move up the rung on the ladder. Um, again, I will reiterate that young people are part of the solution, not the problem. Unfortunately, we have too many adults that are like wanting to wag their finger at what young people are doing and what they're doing wrong. And we really reject that and we really invite them and, and and encourage and support and everything that we do, that they are a part of the solution. They must be a part of the solution. And working in partnership with young people is what will get us to start, solve these problems. Next slide, please. So we kind of wanted to give you some youth engagement scenarios, because as I said, it's really easy to um, spot um, what is like, really good youth engagement and you can really tell um, that great engagement is happening and when it's not so. 
Um, but we really wanted to show you that it is a continuum of youth engagement and involvement. And even an ongoing group may move along this continuum at different times, depending on their funding and related requirements. We all know if you work with young people, where they're at in September and August is not where they're at in April and May, right? Their energy has changed. Um, also, depending on if they're in eighth grade or whether they're in 11th grade, that also is gonna determine kind of where they're at in the continuum. And I just also wanted to speak to, it looks different. We're, we're coming out of a, a pandemic. Um, hopefully this is what we're calling coming out of the pandemic. And so things have looked differently, right? We, uh, Derek and I are adult allies for our um, youth health coalition. And I would say that we were much higher up on the rung, right? Before the pandemic. And we, we saw that during the pandemic when we're meeting virtually, a little bit more support was needed. And that's okay. We want to make sure that we're meeting our young people where they are. Um, so I just wanted to give um, I'm going to go ahead and share three scenarios with you, and I would like you to think about where you think they would be placed on this continuum of heart's ladder. And after I read the scenario, if you can go ahead and drop the number in the chat. So where on the continuum would you think that it falls? And please drop it in the chat. So for the first scenario, um, and this is all things that uh, Derek and I have dealt with. A site coordinator has worked with school administrators to have students provide anti-tobacco information and activities during their lunch break. So that's scenario one. The site coordinator is, has talked to school administration and they have students providing anti-tobacco information during the lunch break. Don, thank you, four, four. Um, Okay, people are saying four, that's about right. That's, we're kind of assigning tasks, right? They're doing it, but the adult ally is kind of taking on that coordinating part, right? They're, they're talking to leadership and they're talking with the administration about setting that up. Great, thank you guys so much for your participation. All right, in scenario two, we have that our, our peer educators are meeting on one of their, their meetings and students share that they want to do classroom presentations. And they've started to create a PowerPoint with things that they think their peers need to know. So where would this scenario fall on this continu continuum? When peer educators are, are meeting and they're deciding that they want to do classroom presentations and they've already started to create a PowerPoint and they have ideas. Okay, so, wow, you guys were quick on that. I gotta keep up with it. Um, so we have um, eight, seven, yes. Seven, seven, solid sevens. I agree, this is somewhere between a six or a seven, right? Where it's joint decision-making and it's also that initiative um, that they are taking on. They're creating the PowerPoint and they're kind of taught asking their their um, adult ally for support in having that happen. Um, that's great, thank you so much. So one more scenario that we have for you is our Courage students at the beginning of, just to give you a little background, at the beginning of the year, um, they decide what priorities they set for themselves. They create and vote on their bylaws each year. And last year, it was a priority of our students to work on getting flavored tobaccos banned. They asked for support in drafting letters that they can send to city council members. And they spoke in support of a flavor ban at, the, at a Contra Costa Board of Supervisors meeting. Where do we think that this would land in the continuum? Seven, eights, eights, eights. Yes, I completely agree. This is a good example of what a really strong and engaged um, partnership with young people looks like. Um, and this was prior to the pandemic and our courage, our Youth Health Coalition is a very strong and engaged 
group. But again, as I said, it can change throughout the year. And, and during COVID, we did see Derek and I and our uh, other adult allies that some support is needed, right? Once you get to a seven or an eight, that doesn't mean that you're always going to stay there, right? Things change and it's about being a uh, being adept, being able to adapt and also most important, meeting young people where they are so that you can support them in, in moving your program and components of your program up Hearts Letter. All right, so thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys participating in that. Um, next slide, please. So talking a little bit about what are the rule, uh, the roles of adult, adult allies and students? And again, the terminology may change from district or if you're um, with a CBO, um, nonprofit, we all have different terms, but basically what we're talking about is the role of the adult and the role of the student. Um, and so for our youth development work, the main role of the adult ally is to provide guidance and support. And we're providing that to students so that they can successfully implement um, education and advocacy activities, including classroom presentations, school-wide events, tabling at lunch, and also uh, community level advocacy. So that is our role. Um, and whether it be with our peer educators or whether it be with our Courage um, Youth Health Coalition members, um, it's most important, right? When, when they are having fun, when they are engaged, it's always gonna be better. So it's our role to support them in, in doing what they um, want to educate their peers on. And just a quick little example of this is, we just did a, um, a student wellness series um, for our county, a high, for our high school students in our county. And we as an adults met, right? We're trying to coordinate this. And we came up with lots of lists of things that we want to do presentations on. And, you know, we had to stop and say, this is for our youth. What do our youth want to learn about? So we took it to our Youth Health Coalition. We took it and asked them, what do you guys want to learn about in a, a student wellness series? What do you guys want to see? So um, even though we as adults have great ideas, and yes, they um, are great and well-intentioned, but it's really important that we remember that our role as an adult is to support. Um, it is to educate and support and help um, provide guidance for students in accomplishing what they have set out as a goal. And then our primary role for, for our students as peer educators, um, and again, our, our peer educators are anywhere through sixth through 12th grade. And anybody that's been on an elementary or middle school campus and a high school campus knows that there is a big difference um, in those age groups. But their primary role, regardless of being at a middle school or a high school, and we also do work with our non-traditional schools, um, which could be either homeschooled, or we also work with students that are incarcerated in different ways. Um, but their main role as peer educators and advocates is to deliver the anti-tobacco messaging within their school community um, and also in their larger community as well. And um, as well as align with non-judgmental approach to supporting non-tobacco users, we really wanna make sure if young people have never tried tobacco products that they never start. And it's really important to encourage current tobacco users to cut or quit back. And again, you need to do that in a non-judgmental way. So with that, I think that's the perfect transition to turn it over to Ms. Marissa. 
Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, as Nicole mentioned, um, my name is Marissa, and I am the intervention specialist um, with the 2P program in Contra Costa County. And um, I really enjoyed listening to Nicole because a lot of what she says is what we do in our work with intervention. So I'm glad to be here today to share some of that information and how we support and empower young people through our intervention work. And as you may know or have realized, oftentimes young people who engage in our prevention work usually do so voluntarily, and they even have a passion for the work. However, working with young people through intervention is typically not voluntary. They're referred as an alternative to suspension option or required to participate. So they're not always as engaged or interested in talking with us. And because of this, it is even more important that we help the young person feel welcome, comfortable, and safe to share. So how can we support and empower a young person in our intervention work? And these are a few of the notes that I want to go over today. First, we should ensure that the young person knows and understands that we come with an open mind, free from judgment, as Nicole was mentioning, and are there to support them and guide them. We should be positive and upbeat as much as possible. This really helps set the tone for a session, especially when meeting with a young person who may not want to be there. And if you show that you're happy to be meeting with them, that seems to rub, rub off and they start feeling the same. In my experience working with young people, they're not always happy or interested in meeting with me. Um, but by the end of the session, uh, they are really engaged, and I even get a few laughs and smiles <laughs> throughout the conversations. So that's always nice. Um, we should also work collaboratively with the young person. Nicole mentioned working in partnership. The same thing goes for working through intervention. We're there to work as a collaborative um, person. Uh, you don't always have to be the expert. <laughs> That's something that I learned. Um, I wanted to learn everything before I met with the young person about uh, tobacco use and everything, um, substance use. And I realized I didn't have to be the expert. And that actually helps in when you're talking with the young person. You will definitely learn from them as much as they learn from you. And we should encourage them to share and elaborate on what they're sharing to gather more information and to help build that rapport. I most definitely have learned something new from every student that I have met with. And each time that I learn something new from them, I always make it a point to acknowledge that they've taught me something. And they're so excited to know that they know something that I don't, right? And they're excited to be able to teach me as well. And Nicole mentioned in our work with young people in prevention, we guide them but ultimately they have the capacity to lead and make decisions on their own. The same is done with working with young people through intervention. We remind them that they are the only ones powerful enough to make their decisions. And we are not there to make the decisions for them, but to support them in the decisions that they want to make. And that is such key. Them knowing and us stating that in the initial conversation about, I'm not here to make your decisions, you are powerful enough to make those decisions. Let's talk about what those decisions are. This helps build their confidence and recognition of their autonomy, especially since most young people or people in general really don't want to be able, don't want to be told what to do. So I mentioned that a young person may not always want to meet or speak with you. And it's okay to acknowledge that, but it's also important to adjust to their resistance rather than opposing it directly. Recognize and focus on the fact that they are there and that it is not always easy to talk to someone, especially to sharing your thoughts and your feelings. Showing appreciation and respect, as well as recognizing their strengths and abilities, encourages the young person to share their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors more openly. And my favorite part of meeting with a young person is helping them realize that they have the power and strength to make their decisions and changes in their lives. And not only in their lives, but they also can be advocates for themselves and others. Many times it's easier to focus on someone else and how the tobacco industry or substances are affecting their lives rather than looking at yourself. And so I encourage them to share the information and the resources 
and use their own personal experiences to make positive change for others. So on a few occasions, I've had students reach out requesting specific resources or information that they want to share with others, such as their siblings or younger cousins. And just as with our prevention work, we have peer advocate where we have peer advocates. We also end up having peer advocates through our intervention services as well. All right. So this is ORS. This is a technique that we use with our intervention work with young people. It's referred to as ORS. And some of you may be familiar with this technique. It stands for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summarization. It is the basic interaction technique and skills that is used in motivational interviewing approach, um, which also some of you may be familiar with. Um, if not, I would strongly encourage you to look up Carl Rogers' motivational interviewing when you have some time. Today, we're just going to be briefly reviewing the ORS technique. So, we find using this technique very useful when engaging with young people, especially in our intervention work, because we often have a limited time to meet with the students um, and we're wanting them to express and share their thoughts and feelings during that limited amount of time that we have. And we're supporting them towards some sort of behavioral change. So in order to begin talking with anybody or especially a young person about change, you need to be able to build that rapport and that comfort level in the conversation. So this really helps. So we use a lot of open-ended questions, the what, how, why questions. And by doing this, it elicits meaningful information and helps us to not do all the talking, allows them to lead the conversation. And we do our best to avoid um, questions that lead to a yes, no, or the dreading, I don't know answer, right? <laughs> we don't wanna hear that. We really wanna gather more information from them during these conversations. So I talked a little bit about um, this on the last slide, but it's important to give affirmations during your sessions that helps build the rapport, it helps build their confidence, and it focuses on the positives. Um, I, I think, them like constantly for being there. I thank them for sharing. I, um, I'm always encouraging them that you're not alone in this. Like I, we were all young at one point, mistakes are gifts. We continue to learn from them. As long as we're learning and growing, that's what makes, makes the difference. So just continuing to reiterate that really helps build their confidence. Like they, they don't feel like they did something wrong or something's wrong with them. And just to listen is not enough. You should use reflective listening to show that you understand what they're saying and sharing. They want to be heard. And you'll notice that in talking with them, they really wanna make sure that they're, that they're understood. And giving the reflection of what you heard to them saying also gives them the opportunity to hear their own words, feelings reflected back at them. So, and it leads to a mutual understanding of the conversation. So you're all on the same page. And ending the session in summarization keeps everyone on the same page, uh, closes the conversation with a plan of action, which is really important, and helps them see the bigger picture of everything that was discussed during that, that session. And it highlights the most important parts of the conversation. So you can pull out certain things that, um, that were mentioned in there that you want them to remember and focus on. So that was really fast. But I want to go ahead and do an activity together so we can practice some of these techniques. And this activity is called, what would you say activity? <laughs> um, and I, using the ORS technique, um, we're going, to, you're going to review each scenario and I'll read it out and identify the best question and or response you would give. And we're going to use the full polling feature for this. Um, so your answers will be anonymous. And full disclaimer, we may see or hear our past selves in some of the statements that we may now recognize as unhelpful. Once we know better, we can do better. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the first scenario. And then after I read that, the polling feature will pop up. 
So scenario number one, you're meeting with a student who was caught vaping on campus and you would like to open up the conversation using an open-ended question. And we're gonna drop the poll, which of the questions would be the best to ask? Right, I think um, having a few more people answering the poll. All right, I think we're good. We're gonna go ahead and end the poll. And let's see. All right, so which is the best to ask? And it seems like a lot of you picked the why. Why do you think young people use vape pens, right? And that is how we ask an open-ended question, the why you can elicit more meaningful response through the why. Why do you, they can elaborate on that response. I know there was some of uh, some people who also chose, are you interested in learning more about vape pens? Which, which is a good question as well. However, when you ask the, are you interested in learning more about vape pens? You may get a yes or no response or I don't know. So we wanna make sure that we're really focusing on getting more information out of the talking with the young person. So thank you so much. The correct answer was, why do you think young people use vape pens? All right, we're gonna go to the second scenario. Focus. During a conversation with a young person who was involuntarily meeting with you about vaping on campus, you want to recognize their presence. What is the best response to do so? All right, we're getting a few more people in here. All right, I think we can go ahead and close the poll. And let's see, it looks like most people chose the, it is great that you are here today. It's not always easy to talk to someone new. Yes, that is great that you said that. Um, the other one is, I know you don't want to be there, be here. And that's fine, right? We, as I mentioned, they may not want to be there and we want to acknowledge that. But another way to acknowledge it with also focusing on the positive and giving affirmation and recognition for them actually being there is to let them know that it is great that they're there today. It's not always easy to talk to someone new. And so that is definitely the correct answer. All right, so. Thank you so much for that. I like it. What were you thinking? Don't you know vaping is dangerous? Sometimes I want to say that, but. <laughs> okay, so this is the third scenario. And you're working with a young person who is describing their struggles with change. What is the best response to show reflective listening? How would you show reflective listening? All right, so
Nice. Thank you for your participation. And we're gonna go ahead and let's see. 100% of you show answered this one. I hear that on one hand, you have reasons why you don't want to change, but yet you recognize reasons why you should change. Yes, definitely. That shows that you understand what they have shared and you validate and acknowledge their feelings. Um, the other choices may not feel as if you're understanding and validating their feelings. So although, you know, they may have mentioned some of the other excuses or reasons why they don't want to change, we really want to make sure that we validate their feelings. So that is right. A was correct. 100%. All right, this is the last scenario. You are running out of you're running out of meeting time and realize that you need to move the conversation along and guide the young person. And you want to show you want to summarize the conversation. What response would help lead into summarizing the conversation? All right, I think we can go ahead and close the poll on that one as well. Thank you for your participation. So these were your options and 100% of you chose D. So let's go over what we talked about so far. This is a great way to begin to summarize the conversation that you had. It gives you an opportunity to bring up some of the key points and serves as a reminder which may even be helpful if you plan on meeting with the student or the young person um, again for our next session. So the, this is the ORS um, technique that's used during this activity. It's definitely something that you practice and um, it may come easy for some people. I know for me, I definitely practice some of these things and just making sure that I'm validating feelings and just really affirming and using open-ended questions um, during our conversations. So I will be available during the Q&A section to answer any questions that you may have. Please add questions in the Q&A box and I'll be ha uh, happy to answer those. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marissa and Nicole. So I am here to help us start to wrap things up. If you can believe it, we're, we're already about 11 minutes out to the end of the webinar. So we're in the, the home stretch. So I do want to just note that, um, just reiterate that during this webinar, we had the opportunity to explore some of the strategies and practices that we utilize that we found help us to more effectively work with young people and honestly, adults as well. Um, Nicole touched on those different levels of youth engagement and how it's really important to recognize that we might be at a different level and it can still be an incredibly meaningful opportunity for young people. You don't have to be at a seven or eight for there to be really meaningful opportunities happening, but that we're always thinking, as Nicole said, we're always assessing where we're at and where we could possibly be. And then, um, you know, Marissa really touched on how we, we really pull in a lot of those youth engagement strategies that work so well in our youth development, our youth leadership programs, to think about young people who might be entering our programs and services in a different way and possibly because they're struggling with use. And so how are we you know, drawing them in and really engaging them at the level that they're comfortable um, and staying open-minded and as non-judgmental as possible? And then, um, you know, again, so looking at the, the how we can utilize these strategies kind of across that continuum of use for young people. So um, next slide, please. So um, we still have some wrap up to do, so don't go yet. However, as we are starting to wrap up, we do invite you to think about a sparklet from the last 45 minutes. So this could be something you learned, um, you know, a specific strategy that you thought was a good one to keep in mind and remember, or even something that it validated for you um, in the amazing work that you already do. You know, what was something that really um, resonated with you because it's something you've, are, you've also found to work really well. Um, it could be something you felt during this time that we've been talking about youth engagement. 
Um, or it could be something that you want to bring with you, right? And, and apply in your work in the future. So please, um, we invite you to share what we like to call sparklets um, in the chat. So please feel free to do that as we move into our Q&A time and wrapping things up. So I do see that we have one question um, that has been left unanswered and that was intentional because I think it's a, it's a potentially complex one. Um, and I am gonna invite um, Nicole, if you would like to, to take a go at first, just thinking like what your initial thoughts are. But the question is, um, when I tried to put my youth in leadership positions, they balk, balked, did you say it balked? Um, which we certainly have had happen, right? At site levels and at our countywide group. Um, how do we build up to this? So I think what I'm hearing is how do you build up that ladder? What are some strategies? I can so identify. Um, <laughs> yes, they they often do balk up at, you know, um, we've experienced this also with our um, Youth Health Coalition, um, you know, and we really, you know, we've just had honest conversations and we really found that when they want to do it, right, they're much more excited to do it. So I am a big organizer and I'm like, I want a communication subgroup to help me send out emails and make phone calls. Okay, that's not what they're interested in. They wanted a social media, you know, subgroup. So it's like, we can support them in areas that they're not quite ready for the communication subgroup. So we're gonna give them a little bit more support in creating emails, but then really trying to educate them and then giving them, sometimes you need to give them the task, right? Smaller tasks but then also supporting them in areas that they want. So if they're wanting to work on a social media or a birthday club or something that's a little bit different, um, or if they're really wanting to play that Kahoot in the classroom, um, really supporting them in, in that area. But it's really, especially with high school students and even middle school students, it's really important to have just a honest dialogue because sometimes there's things that we need to do to for, to get from point a to point b that we may not want to do but we need to do them and having that honest conversation i think they understand that too right if we want to do this we have to do these steps and so them understanding but you know being there to support them Thank you, Nicole. Uh -huh. Yes, we certainly experienced it. And um, I, yeah, I like what you said about coming back to um, just the conversations with them about it, right? Um, and engagement also, something I learned early on um, through um, some mistakes I made um, early on in my career doing youth development work is that engagement looks different <laughs> for different students. So I had a student who showed up and resisted everything. This is a middle school student I worked with many years ago, showed up every meeting, but resisted doing anything beyond that. And so frustrating for the entire year, right? And then um, he actually stopped me in the hallway on the last day that I was there. And he said, I just wanna let you know that if I didn't wanna be there, I wouldn't have been there. And so I'm like, okay, he needed to be there. I'm like, note that his engagement looked very different than many of the other students, but he was still, it was still a meaningful opportunity for him. And so obviously this was, you know, I don't know, 18 years ago and I still carry that with me. And so thinking about what engagement looks like and yeah, what's important to them and what they're, you know, and, and coming back to the relationships and like really getting to know them as people. Um, and then, yeah, how we can work together. And if I can just add one more thing, I would just say that I would question them on why are they resistant? Like if there's tasks or something that need to be done, kind of asking them what about this task is making you kind of resistant and there may be like a workaround sometimes you can you know it's like they're okay with this aspect of it but not this aspect so really having that open dialogue is is really important um 
Thank you so, so much, Emily, Nicole, and Marissa for sharing all your knowledge. I think youth engagement is a difficult but such an important part of this work. So thank you for all the work you all do and to your team especially. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, have a few announcements. So the California School-Based Health Alliance um, is going to have their second virtual um, annual conference, November 2nd through the 4th. So please save the date. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Also, I just want to encourage everyone in the link will be in the chat to um, use our website and consider if you're able to, to become a member of the California School-Based Health Alliance and membership benefits include conference registration discounts, member only tools, resources, technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. Um, so please, whenever you get a chance, um, feel free to look through that link. And next slide and last slide. So please stay connected with us. If you have any questions, um, my email is listed on this slide and there is our social media, all our platforms. And before our time together comes to an end, um, I would like you all, I would like to ask you all to please um, fill out the evaluation so that we can continue to grow um, and improve in this work. And so that it will automatically pop up at the end of this webinar. There are roughly five short multiple choice questions. And thank you again um, for joining us today. And we hope you're staying safe and healthy. Thank you, everyone.